welcome back to the Suck My DFS podcast presented by the Game House. I'm not riding solo this episode. I've got the coach, Will Shearholtz, back. What's up, Will? Not much, man. How are you doing? I'm, I'm happy to be back. I am. I'm doing okay. I'm very frustrated with fantasy. It was a rough week. That Monday night game really broke me. Oh gosh, and it was so, it was so close. It but really I'm not, was a make or break game. I'm not throwing a fit because that's just that's just how fantasy works. Sometimes it breaks your way. Sometimes it doesn't. I've had a couple more bad breaks than good breaks. Uh, fortunately, it was not my father, and I did not get to play against Melvin Gordon and Sony Michelle in the same lineup. That would have been nice. Wow. Would have been nice. That So what was it, one point out of those two running backs? It might have been like two and a half. You might have had a couple catches, but the Melvin Gordon scratch shocked me. I couldn't believe it. I woke up and I was looking at the box score of that game because it was in London. And I was like, why hasn't Melvin Gordon carried the ball? And then I was like, oh, he's inactive. I missed the opening of the game. I saw Eckler, but the I think it was the Chargers' first drive. I saw Eckler on the field. I'm thinking, what is he doing? Why isn't he in? Then they go to Gordon – who's on street clothes. And then I look back at this. They said, yeah, he was on the injury report Friday. Saturday was still on there, but it's not as if he was doubtful. Like Paul Richardson was doubtful going into Sunday. Didn't play. I don't know. I think that was, that was crazy to me. I almost think they legitimately had Melvin Gordon and they thought to themselves, we can beat them without Melvin Gordon. I don't know about that. I mean, I do, I, I do err on the side of if he's really hurt, said him. And they also said the plane ride had something to do with it. I mean, I guess being in that uncomfortable position for so long, I get it, but I, I don't buy that at all. Maybe it made it – he didn't get it as, as limber as he wanted and then aggravated it further in practice, but don't give me the plane ride. Don't give me that. <laughs> they should have just bust him. They should have sent him over on the Titanic like they bust Watson from Houston to Jacksonville. Yeah. How great, That's how great was that? I oh, my that. gosh. I loved that. That was hilarious when I heard that. Uh, but I want to get into something. There are two things – uh, I'll let you go Amari Cooper first because that's what happened first yesterday. I want to get to something that happened last night on the broadcast, and it's actually going to lead into my top five takeaways. So, Will, talk about the Amari Cooper trade. Well, I, first of all, on Monday Night Football, they were talking about, like, who won that trade. Jason Witten's like, Dallas won the trade. Oh, of course. Like, not even giving it a second thought that the Raiders won the trade. Like, really? And Dallas, I think it's close. I, I think Oakland won the trade because they got a first-rounder for him. I'm not saying it was a bad trade for Dallas because they do desperately need some wide receiver yes. help. And I think he'll be good with Dak. I really do. I think it's going to open some things Plus up. Plus they have the offense. bye week. Dallas is yeah, on bye. Yeah. This is, they so could right not have made the, the trade. trade at a better. I will give Jerry that. If the price wasn't, if the price was too much, you can debate that. At least the timing was perfect. Amari gets in the building and now he can, he can actually get prepared for the next game yeah. and look like he's played there. So I like I mean, that. Cars next. It's coming. <laughs> It's got to be coming. <laughs> I have a feeling, uh, you know, we talked about this in pre-show. I have a feeling that's going to be popping up somewhere in your takeaways. Yeah. But, like, I I do want to – I would talk about that real quick. The fact that neither of them even wanted to even entertain the idea that, Dal- that Oakland got the better end of this deal, it, it's just very disingenuous on their part. And, I mean, I'm about, I'm about to get into this. ESPN needs to have some sort of statistician or producer in there really either – pushing Tessator to be the voice of reason. Somebody has to learn what the hell is going on. And I'm going to get into this. You know, I was on a rampage last night because the announcers just would not stop talking shit about how the Giants went for two. And I could tell Witten was fine with the decision, but he didn't have, you know, the math or the sort of the evidence to back it up. And Booger, oh my God, Booger, this is the worst game Booger's done. And I don't think he's actually, he's not that terrible, but last night he was horrendous. And well, I'm about to break this math down for you. The Giants made, if you just go mathematically, I know there are variables that you can't quantify with numbers that, you know, enter into decisions, especially in football, you know, baseball. You can. It's almost completely a numbers game, but there are certain things a manager has to have a feel for. Football, it's totally different. It's calling plays is really all about feel and the motion of the game. But here's what I want to get into. So the Giants were down 14 points. So 20 to 6, they score the touch and they go for two. And here's the math behind it. Here's why going for two was the right decision. Well, on average... And the biggest sample size they can keep track of, two-point conversions have been converted at a 45% success rate. So 45% chance of converting. And let's just, for the sake of this math, the PATs are 100%. And we know that's not that's not true. We just saw one of the best kickers ever miss one of the most important extra points of his life. So 
we'll just give 100% certainty for PATs. Now, let's say here, – here's the three situations that can happen. They score the touchdown. They go for two. They have a 45% chance of converting. Let's say they get it. That's So the 45% happens, and they get it. Well, the next time, they only need a, an extra point to win the game, which is 100% certainty for this argument. 45 times 100 equals 45. So by, doing, by converting the two points on the first touchdown, 45% chance to win. Now, let's flip it. Let's say that they don't convert the first two-point conversion, so that's a 55% chance. Well, because they didn't get it, they now have to go for it the second time. And let's say they get it. Well, that's a 45% chance of them converting the second two-point attempt. 55 times 45, 25% to go to overtime. Let's say they don't convert either of them. 55% times 55%, they don't convert either of the two-point conversions. That's a 30% chance to lose. By going for it the first touchdown, 45% chance to win, a 25% chance to tie, or a 30% chance to lose. And nobody brought that up. Like, that's not hard math. You just sit there, you think about it, you find out what the conversion rate is, and you just do it. And I understand that not every two-point conversion is created equal. There are variable factors that play into that decision. I'm all for him going for two in that scenario. And I'm glad afterwards he just, you know what, we've, we've internally looked at the math, and we're fine with the decision. Now, I want to get your opinion. So here's here's my argument. Right. And I, I agree with the math, and I don't think it was necessarily the wrong decision. Here's my argument against it. Mm -hmm. Teams, and not every team does it the same way, but teams go into a week having certain two-point plays. Of course. Scripted out. They know what plays they'll run. If they have to go for two the first time, they know what they're going to run. If they have to go for two another time, they know what they're going to run. I don't think they ever really script out three two-point no, plays. No, that's brutal. So if you go for two on that first one and you run your two-point play and it's a two-point play that you like yeah. and you run it to perfection, so you've burned it so you can't do it again. If it works, it's fine. But if it doesn't work, yes. then you got to go with your secondary two-point play when you need it the most. Right. So then I'm not saying it's necessarily the wrong thing because hopefully you've got two two-point plays that you feel really good right. about anyway. But usually you got one you feel really good. You have about. one that you go to. You're like, we, yes. for your life, run this two this play to get two. And you're right. They usually have one that they go to, but you will have a handful of plays that you're considering. And I say that's actually that's a really good point. And I'd also argue, okay, let's say you have to go into your bag for the second two point conversion play. Well, now I have a whole – I have three and a half quarters worth of data telling me how the Falcons are playing certain sets, how my quarterback's playing, how my receivers are playing, how the line is blocking, how they're handling blitzes. I have a ton of data to where even if it's not a play we repped, there's a play that I can go to and feel and feel good about it. But, I mean, that's a really good point you brought up. You, you usually have one go-to play, and if you don't get it, you got to go to a less optimal play. Here's the, here's the other thing. You know the saying, you only go for two if you have to. You know, like when people say that. Right. You know, there's a coach in the NFL that does that. His name's Andy Reid. Yeah. He's had an unbelievable amount of success doing that. He doesn't go for two unless he has to. Right. In that New England game, late in the game, yes. there was a time where they could have gone for two to tie it or kick the extra point to be down by one point. And right. they decided to kick the extra point. And I'm not saying this is the same thing. It's not situation. the same thing. Not yeah. the same thing. But I'm saying, like, there's something to be said about teams that do that. They only go for two when they have to. Yes. And I would say, and my counter to that would be now the Eagles, with their their new regime, they have made a – it's a point of emphasis for them to go for it on fourth down, to go for it, to convert two-point conversions. Because they did this two weeks ago against the Vikings. Yeah. Now, they didn't win the game, but they converted the first two-point conversion. And gave themselves a better chance. So I, I, I do. I'm not. I'm not saying there's I only. I kind of like the new I'm thought. Not, like yeah, the I'm new not saying aggressive style. Yeah, I like it. And I'm not saying there's one absolute way to do things. But I think it's 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 good. It's only fair that everyone understands the math and understands yeah. that you know if your head coach isn't at least considering it, you don't have a very good head coach. You just you're behind. You, you're you're giving another team an advantage that you could have yourself. And if I have an, especially if I have an elite offensive coordinator, an elite offense, now I also give my best guys the best chance by letting them know, like, hey, probably, you know what? I mean, given all the information, we should we should do this. So let's also give our best players, the best coaches, even more of advantage on the other team. Uh, and I'm not, like I said, it's not an absolute. I just I'm 
totally in favor of uh, of Shermer's decision last night. And that goes into my top five takeaway, the Monday Night Football crew blows. How there wasn't a producer, I did this math on a note card in maybe two minutes. How is there not a producer in the break that can do this math and say, hey, guys, when we come back, I want you to talk about this, and I want you to say, hey – Maybe this is what they're thinking. They but don't no, even have to but, present the numbers. They but, can just say math tells you you should do it. Math tells you in that situation you have a higher chance to win than to lose by doing that. That's all they have to say. But they don't say that because they don't want their guys to look like idiots. And I, I totally get that. But you're also doing the audience a disservice. You're not being genuine about the, the presenting of the game because Witten – had a feeling. He said, I kind of like he, – he, if you could hear him talk, he liked their decision, but he just couldn't reinforce it with this math. And that's not really his job. But for them to go that – for them to never even bring it up, I thought was – it was just – it was awful. It was a big indictment on their crew and their production. So uh, I'm glad it happened because now people are talking about it. And now coaches are really thinking like, whoa, hold on. Like, is that really the case? You're going to see more teams at least entertaining the idea uh, – and I'm, all, I'm always good for, for new ideas and, and correcting things that were like the status quo that aren't exactly true. So uh, my number five takeaway, this Monday Night Football crew blows. And I'm leaving it you. at that. I agree with you. You're number I, five. I really miss Tony Romo, by the way, on Monday Night Football. You mean Gruden? Well, not Gruden. Well, Romo's on Sunday. But I want Romo on Monday. <laughs> he just, I don't know. Can he do both? I mean, I don't think there's a precedent for that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, my number five takeaway, um, I've already talked about it a little bit, but Raiders really got a first rounder for Amari Cooper, and I feel like an idiot because I said no, no way, way first rounder last I week. I know, no way, but they did. Um, so now they've had, I saw a statistic in the last 16 seasons, they've had two first rounders become um, Pro Bowlers. They've traded them both this season. Uh, there's one more that's coming soon, and his name's Derek Carr. He'll be traded, gotta be traded in the next week or so, um, I would think. But I was wrong, Mari Cooper for a first rounder. That's all right. I've been wrong plenty of times this year. <laughs> and it's also Jerry. It's it's also Jerry. So there's always that element that you can never truly predict. Uh, but you know that's enough. We got to move into the fantasy segment of the podcast. Into movers and shakers. Will do you have any quarterbacks moving up or moving down? I've got Dak moving up. Okay. Um, for pretty obvious reasons. Number one, they're they're going into the buy and they just got Amari Cooper so they can bring him up to speed. But we've now seen two weeks in a row good play from Dak. They didn't win this week, but he he had a good game through the air and on the ground. He scored touchdowns on the ground back to back weeks. So he's really get, getting it going with his legs. Um, so it's just more consistent play out of him and that offense specifically. Listen, they're in every football game they play. If you look at their box scores, they haven't – I know this is a defensive note, but defensively they haven't given up more than 24 points in a game. So they're, they're You've been in, on their defense for weeks I now. I have, I have. But, but that, it's just something to say, like, Dak – their defense keeps them in games, and Dak has been doing a better job of late. I, I was off Dak all season, but I'm kind of starting to come around yeah. to him. It was definitely impressive, especially when Ezekiel Elliott is nowhere to be found. And I don't know if that was his fault or if – I mean, I've talked about this. The Redskins' front is really good. Yes. It is really good. It's really tough against the run. I'm so excited to play that Washington defense. I, I'm between Washington or Indy this weekend in DFS. Washington hosts the Giants, I believe. you got to go Washington. Or Indy gets the Raiders. I still go Washington. I, it's going to be close. Washington gives me more flexibility, but that's a decision I'm, I'm toying with already. Um, quarterback moving down. I have nobody, and okay. I tried real hard to, to come up with some names. I mean, there's guys that are that are, aren't playing well. I mean, I could list Blake Bortles if I really wanted to. Exactly. Though, but I, I don't have anybody like important moving down. Right. Uh, I have a first. I have a guy moving up and moving down simultaneously. I like it. Mitch Trubisky. Yeah. Fantasy. He's a top 10 quarterback right it's now. Crazy. This this But rushing, he doesn't target wide receivers. This rushing is unreal. I did not see this coming at all. Now, he's not going to have a game like this where he gets a rushing touch, and I think he had 80 yards rushing, so that's way too much. But from a fantasy standpoint, I would feel confident rolling with Mitch Trubisky in a pinch, or if, you know, I'm between him and... I'm trying to think of a back-end starter, like maybe between him and Dalton right yeah, now. Yeah, like right now, that's maybe. what I would say, yeah. Dalton. So I have Trubisky moving up in fantasy. I have him moving down in real life because 
all he wants to do is run. He is missing. I rewatched. I already rewatched the game. He's missing wide open guys. He missed wide open guys against Miami the week before. Oh my goodness. I mean, it, it's really troubling because it's not going to go. It's not going to be looked at because he played so well and the Bears played so well offensively, but he was not any good. He was not good at all. At one point late in the game, he had targeted Allen Robinson one time and Taylor Gabriel one time, and the rest had gone to tight ends and running backs. Yeah, Burton and Cohen. It was just like the whole third, offense. It was the third quarter when this happened. And then after that, the targets were like Gabriel on screens. Like he, yeah, and, he then miss, and then missing Anthony Miller for touchdowns again. And throwing the ball in double coverage in the end zone and almost getting picked off. Yeah, I mean, he was not good. No. He was great at fantasy. Very bad. Very bad in real life. Uh, but that's it. That's all I've got there. I'm mean, you're right. I'm not going like to get into the though. obvious, but I'm a little disappointed in Dalton. I think this is a one-off, though. I don't think he's going to be this bad the rest of the year. And he's got the Bucks, which is always nice. Yes. Um, but no, we can move on. Will running backs moving up? I got, I got a couple obvious ones here. But Nick Chubb, obviously, after the Hyde trade, had a really solid week, 80 yards and a touchdown this week for Cleveland. And on on that same topic, I've got TJ Yeldon going down with Carlos Hyde. Yeah, we have no idea how that's going to work. First of all, TJ Yeldon was on his way down because they get pass happy and, and Yeldon doesn't get the ball very much. Right. And without Fournette, I'm saying. And now you've got Hyde coming in to the picture. Who knows what that timeshare is going to look like. I, I've got to think if they're trading for Hyde, Hyde's going to get significant carries. Yeah. I. It makes no sense because why do you need two starters – when you also have Leonard Fournette, who's going to supposedly come back and take the role. I'm just waiting any day now for this news to drop that he's on IR for yeah, the rest gotta, of the year. It's got to be happening, right? I don't know. I you mean, they've need... cut, and, But they've, they've cut Jamal Charles, so it's just those two. I'm not going to stick around to see how that goes. And that hurts because I was riding Yeldon for a while, and that sucks yeah. now. As a Fournette owner, that really blows. I'm going to have to scramble here. Uh, hopefully Lamar Miller can come through on Thursday night against the woeful oh, Dolphins. Trust, with Hyde going out, I, I texted you. I, I always start James said, White. but screwed. But yet you're White, White's your guy now. James White is fine. He's a he's a fantasy starter. But my second back I started was Gore. And I picked him up five minutes Brutal. before the game started. Yeah. But I, I didn't have any other good options because I had Connor on by. And yeah. I just – I mean, it was it was tough. It was tough. T. Y. Hilton, that trade worked out for you though. The T. Y. Hilton trade did work. Yeah, there you go. I like I like seeing that. Uh, okay, so my running backs moving. Marlon Mack, we got to talk about. I had no expectations for him. I thought this was just going to be another timeshare we can't predict or anything. But they loved Marlon Mack. Uh, he's got a great matchup against the Raiders this weekend. So he's moving up for me. I hate to say this, but Tariq Cohen is moving up for me too. Yeah, gotta be. In in games where they're shooting out or they're playing against a better offense, Cohen is is going to be the guy from, you know, everything we've seen. Trubisky's going to go to him, and they'll still give him some carries when he's in. Um, and then I don't say moving down because I don't want to make presumptions about what's going to happen without any data. But David Johnson, if he has one good game. We ha- you got to get rid of him because against the Denver Broncos, who allowed back-to-back 200-yard rushing efforts to the Rams and the Jets, he was nowhere to be found. And I think a lot, all of it has to do with Mike McCoy. So maybe Leftwich can can get this offense going. But if David Johnson, who plays the Niners this weekend, has a good game, get rid of him Don't for him. something. Get rid of him. I'm with you. Uh, for you wide receivers, well. Uh, this one hurts me. Marvin Jones. Um, oh, my God. He's, con- he's been falling, but he's continued to fall. He got four targets, had 29 yards receiving this past week. Uh, man, I'm, I didn't even consider playing him going into this week. He, he was a pretty high pick for me, but I started uh, Edelman and Diggs yeah. and Funchess at my flex. Funchess, baby. And Funchess had a good week, yeah. and I'll continue to play those three. Right, and ha- this is crazy. So last week we didn't get to do the guys we were wrong about. The week before we did people we were right about. Last week and you weren't here. This Thursday we're going to the guys we messed up on on the pre-draft process or whiffed on. And top three has to be for me Marvin Jones. Marvin Jones I was up there. loving Marvin Jones. I loved him so much that I was trying to get him, but people kept taking him ahead of me. Yeah. So I luckily have no shares, but it has been horrendous it's if you're a Marvin bad. Jones owner it's and you spent bad. the fifth round pick on him. Um, and then 
I've got you mentioned him earlier, but Josh Gordon stock rising. Got seven targets. Um, I with especially with Gronk out of the lineup, I love the way they use him. Yeah. A uh, big bodied receiver. They went to him on a on a fourth and one play through a fade to him. He yeah. went up and got a ball for Brady. Snatched it and then smashed his head on the yeah. ground. I love it. Um so first hundred yard game as a Patriot, but he's playing good football right now. He's kind of a weapon for them. It's still kind of tough to play on a consistent basis because you don't really know where that offense is going to go. Um, but he's doing a really nice job now. I so love him now that rising. Michelle's out. I mean, it's not like Kenyon Varner is going to get all of Michelle's no, workload. No. I, just, I don't think so. Maybe they trust him. Uh, I don't I know. Think, I, think, I like Gordon's I, I think like James Gordon's prospects. White's, James White goes back to the backfield, is used more as a rusher than he is as a – I mean, he's still going to be used as a receiver, but James White's going to get more carries than he normally does, which yeah. means – Josh Gordon's going to get more time in the pass game. I also think like somebody like Dorsett's going to get more time in the pass game. Too. He can't get less, <laughs> which is weird because he played well at the beginning. He was of the well. Season. He played well. It was really Hogan was the whipping boy. Everyone was pissed off at, and then Gordon's here, and then somehow Edelman comes back, and Hogan is now more relevant. Yeah, and H- Dorsett's some non-factors. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So uh, wide receiver moving up, man. Adam Thielen got it done again. This is. Unreal. I'm considering making a trade for him in a league, and I'm fine to pay the premium because I think he's got three more games of 100 yards in him because the matchups are just so good. Unless you think the Saints are going to bump Lattimore inside for, you know, all of the snaps because that's where Thielen goes, then you need to be – I'm going to try to get Adam Thielen on one of my rosters before the week's over. And I might have to wait to do it during the Vikings bye, and I'll take the L. But if I'm still in contention, I want that guy going down the stretch oh, in fantasy yeah. playoffs. Uh, and then moving down the entire Jets wide receiver core, <laughs> how in the hell does Jermaine Curse Gers- go from targeted nine times to zero points? Zero. Po- I got a zero in my DFS lineup from him. Well, uh, how about this? So both not not both my lineups cashed in DFS. Only one did. The Cam Newton quarterback lineup cashed, of course. And I had the Washington. It took late to get that done. But. Oh, I was freaking out. And I had the Washington defense on the back end, which helped too. But, dude, that line cashed with LaShawn McCoy giving me point one and Jermaine Curse giving me zero. Wow. Well, Jermaine Curse was like forty percent owned in 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 a, these fifty fifties and cash games, so. I locked out hard, and Cam was less than 11% owned everywhere, which really helps. Yeah, but, uh, it did. Man, these Jets wide receivers are garbage. They're really bad. Garbage. I'm only high on one tight end. I think Zach Ertz is the best tight end in the NFL now. Uh, maybe not from – if you want to argue like Gronk has – or Kelsey's better skills, whatever, the production speaks for itself. They don't go a game without getting Zach Ertz involved. Uh, pivoted late to get as Zach Ertz on every lineup – on FanDuel, that paid off nicely. Um, so I, that's the only guy moving. Zach Ertz, I think Zach Ertz is the best tight end in the NFL. The way I they like use it. him, man, uh, it's it's hard to deny. Any tight ends moving up or down for you, Will? I, I, we've already talked about him moving down, but he's got to be moving down more because Evan Ingram came back and was fully healthy for that game. Eli goes for almost 400 yards passing, <laughs> and, and like Evan Ingram 20? gets 14 yards receiving. Oh, my God. They ran him on two screens. That was his two receptions. So, like – Eli has his best statistical day that he's had this season, yeah. and Ingram's a non-factor. So that's really hard for me because I held on to him through the injury. I'm going to end up dropping him. Yep. Um, but And we've already talked about him a little bit too, but I've got Njoku moving up again. Njoku looked good. He's a serious red zone target. He's been a consistent player pretty much the bulk of this season. Gets about five catches a game. So as long as Baker continues to develop and Joku is going to continue to do his thing as well. I moved off of my Baker and Joku sack for Nick Chubb. I'm like, I can't have Chubb, Baker, and Joku. I mean, you can, but that's just not smart. Yeah. It's not smart to have all that invested in the Browns. So, yeah, I, I plugged in Chubb because everyone plugged in Chubb, so that moved me off in Joku. But I loved in Joku. That's what I said. I said I start with Baker, Mayfield, and Joku, Gurley, and Thielen, and go from there. Yeah. So, uh, I moved off, but it, it didn't crush me. Um, but no one, no one truly, truly cares about that. Uh, <laughs> let, let's get into our. Uh, let's go back to our top five list. Will before we move on, your number four, number three takeaways uh, from Week Eight. Num- number four for me. This is about a prediction I had last week, but I said the Eagles Panthers game would be a really great game, and I said Cam and Wentz would both play great. 
Uh, Wentz had an MVP caliber day. Uh, I mean, he was like 31. Of right up until the final drive. Until the final drive. Um, so he was he was unbelievable all day. Cam was silent all day until the fourth quarter, going into the wind, yep. leads three touchdown drives and played unbelievable. Like he was he was one of the most clutch. It was the one of the most clutch games I've seen Cam play. And he's fourth got, and twelve conversion to yes, Torrey Smith. A, he like jumped up yeah. and took a hit and completed the pass. But man, and Cam's led sixteen fourth quarter comeback comeback, so he's been a clutch performer in his career. But man, down seventeen nothing on the road yep. against the Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles, and you put up twenty one fourth quarter points into a stiff win. Nicely done. It's big time. Nicely done. Um, number three for me. Look out, the Lions have a run game. First time in my <laughs> lifetime that they've had a legitimate run game. Uh, Carry on Johnson obviously had a big week. I'm not getting too far up on him because I want to see consistent um, play out of him. But he's got two 100-yard games this season. Lions hadn't had one, a 100-yard rusher in a really long time before this year, so I'm kind of I'm I'm a little bit ex- not excited, but the Lions are You're like intrigued. starting to contend a little bit. Like they've got an interesting roster in that division with Green Bay being the wor- maybe the worst team in the division right no. now. It's it, – uh, we, we'll see. The we'll Lions see. roster minus Aaron Rodgers is better than Green Bay's. Yeah, I don't know their defense that well, but pro- you probably – it's 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 close at least. So I mean, here, here's the thing. So the Lions don't have a good run D, right? No. But, but, <laughs> but, let's, but let's think about that division. They play the Packers. No run No, no run, run D. Offense. No run game, yeah. The Minnesota's got a little bit of a run game, but not as not what we thought it was going to be. Right. They've got Latavius Murray. And then the Bears throw the ball to Tarek Cohen, and Jordan Howard's irrelevant. Yeah. So that's what they're dealing with in the division. So does it really matter? I, that's a, that's I a mean, really, it matters, that's, of course. Yeah, that's an interesting point you raised. I don't I don't know. I, I'm not saying they're going to like win that division or anything, but the, the it's a competitive division top to bottom it for is. sure. It definitely is. And I do want to just really quick on that game. I was so happy. I, I didn't have any anyone in that game going besides Kenny Galladay. So I should not have been happy. But I was so happy that the Lions coaching staff destroyed Miami on the ground and essentially made the Bears look like complete fools for not doing the exact same thing the week before. Because on Johnson in the first half had over 100 yards rushing. The whole team averaged seven yards a carry against this Dolphins team. And I'm just glad that coaching isn't dead. That Patricia actually learned something from Belichick and said, oh my god, this team's horrendous against the run. Well, we'll just pound them. We don't care. We will just keep pounding them. And I'm so glad I saw that because the Dolphins are horrific. The only reason I'm holding on to LaShawn McCoy is for his two games against the (laughs) Dolphins. That is it. Two games against the Dolphins will make my season for LaShawn McCoy. I like it. I like that rant. Oh, my. And LaShawn McCoy. Oh, have the courtesy to get hurt in the fourth quarter. Not the first carry of the first drive. And landing on your head... I hate commenting on guys outside of what I can see on the field, but it kind of feels like LaShawn McCoy has checked out this season. Yeah. Right? Especially against, you know, they really could have used him against the Vikings, but he sat that game out. They benched him because he wasn't healthy. And then he's probably sad he didn't get in on that game. I think he – I'm not going to say with certainty because I don't have the information or the means to say this, but LaShawn McCoy may may check out. So, oh. Hope I'm fingers crossed he goes off against the Dolphins. I need those games to happen soon. Why has that not happened yet? That divisional game not been played yet. But I got to get into my top fives because we are running long. Uh, number four, I believe in the Saints. Five straight wins, I believe, since losing Week One to the Bucks. The defense looks good. They just acquired Eli Apple, yeah, that's so a big pickup for them. They they said out loud like, "Hey, we're looking to acquire defensive back." I almost thought they were going to go get Patrick Peterson because Peterson's on record being like, "I want out." Could you imagine if they made a move for Peterson? Marshawn Lattimore and Patrick Peterson. That would be so sick. They would probably be the second. They're probably the second favorite in the NFC already behind the Rams, but that would put them in contention oh, because 100%. now they have guys who can match up man to man with the with with that team. Uh, so I believe in the Saints and their defense. Number three, Jags are done, and it's not an overreaction to the quarterback play. Uh, it's really just about he can't keep. Why is he fumbling the ball? It's he not sucks. even like he's getting hit hard. He sucks. He just has bad fundamentals. He's not 
protecting the football. And when you turn the ball over in your territory, most offenses are going to score. So it's not even about how bad Bortles played. It's that this offensive line is decimated. No running back. Saquon Barkley would not do anything for this offensive line because they're so ravaged by injury. And this defense... You know, for all the talk they did, and I'm also glad the Eagles are losing because all they did was talk shit in the offseason on the Patriots, and look where they are. Patriots primed 30 points in a row, scored 30 points in every game, I think the last three or four games. They're about to roll Buffalo on Monday Night Football, take control of that division and contend in the AFC, and where are the noisy Eagles? Not even first in their division, the three Redskins. Three and four, baby. Uh but yeah, if the Jags, if you guys are going to talk all this shit, you have to back it up. If you're going to keep talking Yang, you have to back it up on the field, and they didn't. So, uh, to me, the Jags are done. I like it. I think we're going to disagree about that later on in we'll, the show, we'll though. We will, yes. Uh, let's move into these the waiver wire look-aheads. As you know, if you've been listening, uh, we review our suggestions last week, how those did. Then I recommend guys to pick up this week. Will gives you a little more long-term picture. Guys you can pick up for two or three weeks in a row. And let's get started. You know, we nailed quarterback. We recommended Trubisky, Flacco, and Mayfield. All of them yes. did well. Great All of them really helped you out. And if you need them for a spot start, especially Trubisky. Good Lord, that rushing. Uh, let's go to our running backs. You know, you go three for three in quarterback. The running back waiver wire. Is pretty dreadful, and we don't do the obvious plays. We don't go Marlon Mack. Like we just, there's no point. Everyone knows to go get Marlon Mack. You know to go get these guys. Uh, Ito Smith. You know the te- the Tevin Coleman touchdown is the difference. Whoever gets the touchdown in that backfield makes but value. Ito Smith got gets snaps and gets carries. Exactly. So like it's never. It's not a bad play. Peyton Barber got hawked for Ronald Jones. Of course he did. And then Frank Gore. I'm happy about this because it looks like they're transitioning more to Kenyon Drake. So Kenyon Drake owners who stuck it out are getting rewarded, and I'm 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 happy about it. Uh, wide receivers. One for three. Chester Rogers. You know T. Y. Hilton was back, and they made a commitment to running the ball, so that was a loss. Marquise Goodwin. Oh, my God, Marquise Goodwin. How? All they had to do was throw, and he was nowhere to be found. Uh, And then Cole Beasley, 9.1 points, half-point PPR. That got it done if you had to start Cole Beasley, so that's a win. CJ Uzuma got in the end zone, so we're counting that as a win as well. Heck, yeah. And then Colts defense smashed, even against Derek Anderson. And then Dolphins defense, not so much. Uh, But you know what? It's another week. We got new suggestions. Uh, two for you. Trubisky, if for some reason he's not out there, or if some reason he's out there, go get him. Uh, 51% owned, so may, there's a there's a good chance good he's chance. not there. But how do you know that the um, who was just who was just on by? How do you know the Ben Roethlisberger owner isn't dropping him to pick Ben up again? Right. Or that, and you better go get him quickly because the Falcons, the Chargers, the Cowboys, and the there's a fourth team on by the and the Titans. So people are going to need quarterbacks this week. Get them if you can. Other guy, Case Keenum, 11% owned. Ooh. I you're really hurting if you need it, but he gets the Chiefs and I he did okay against them on Monday Night Football. No, he actually he didn't do that well. I don't even think he threw a touchdown in that game. Um but shit, if you need somebody, go get Case Keenum. I'm with you. There's uh, not much there. Trubisky's the optimal one. He if definitely he's available. is. He definitely is. Uh, for two weeks down the road, for me, I mentioned him earlier, but Dak Prescott, um, he's coming off a buy. He gets by. He's got buy this week, and then he gets the Titans at home on yeah. Monday Night Football. Not bad. Um, so last time they were on prime time, Dak had a really good game against the Jags, uh, and I expect him to have a good good rushing upside in this game. 18th ranked rushing defense. Uh, He'll have Amari Cooper. Have I think Cooper. I think Amari Cooper helps Ezekiel the most. It, it's going to open up the field. I hope so. So now you've got Cole Beasley on the inside, in the middle of the field. You've got Amari Cooper on the outside of the field. And then you can run zone read with Dak and with Zeke. Yep. Like, you're in good shape now. You're better shape. In better least. shape, for sure. So he's 30% on. So I like him two weeks down the road. There you go. Uh, let's get to running backs. Um, uh, Mike Davis. Okay. You know who the Seahawks get? The Detroit Lions. All this team wants to do is pound the rock. Chris Carson, there's no way he's available, but Mike Davis gets work. And for some reason he gets goal line work. So maybe he can get you 40 yards and a touch because they're going to pound the Lions and the Lions cannot stop the run. 18% owned, almost a guarantee you can pick him up. Uh, 
Alfred Morris, because Matt Breida just cannot stay healthy, 40%. His ownership probably dropped with the Mostert breakout on Monday Night Football. So he's an option if he's there. And LeGarrette Blount, because the running back waiver wire is garbage. Yeah. Like I said, we don't do the obvious. If you didn't get Doug Martin already, it's on you. Yeah. Marshawn Lynch is done. Uh, maybe go Jalen Richard if you're in a PPR, but man. Oh, that's like one. this waiver wire at running back is just always the worst. One of my guys was Jalen Richard um, because Marshawn's gone. They are going to play Doug Martin, obviously, but PPR league, he's going to get a lot of work. Um, so they get San Francisco in two weeks. So Richard might be a good option in PPR leagues. My other one, and he's a little bit more heavily owned, especially after the high trade, but Duke Johnson uh, in Cleveland, he gets the Chiefs at home in two weeks. This is a great PPR league in that game because – you got to think the Chiefs are going to build a lead, and you got to think Baker's going to have to throw the ball, and that means Duke Johnson's going to get a lot of work, um, especially against that Chiefs defense. So I like if he, that. If he's out there in two weeks, that would be a good play. If you're in a PPR league, especially. You're right. And against the Steelers this weekend, you know, maybe the Steelers get up big, and that same projected game flow happens. But he's not even a terrible ad for this week. Yep. And like I said, we don't. If you didn't get Nick Chubb last week, or you have some weird thing. Like where once Friday at a certain time hits, no one can pick up players over the weekend. That sucks. But if for some miracle he's there, just go get Nick Chubb. That's a starting running back. That's that's gold on the waiver wire. And playing. Yeah, that's gold sitting out there. Uh, wide receiver Christian Kirk gets the 49ers. Is you know he's that's what I talked about last week. he's Rosen's number one guy yeah. right now. He's 18 percent on. Let's go back to the old Willie Sneed. Well, hopefully he doesn't keep dropping passes like he did in the Ravens Saints game. 25 percent owned, and I love this one, especially with the rumors around Demarius Thomas, Cortland Sutton, nine percent owned against the Chiefs. What's the rumors around uh, trading? Really? Trading DT? Wow. To who? I don't know. Apparently the Eagles were in play for Amari Cooper. Because they don't think they have enough at wide receiver. I so agree with that. If they go get DT, that would be pretty sweet. That would be. Demarius Thomas owners might feel better about themselves with, with Wentz instead of a – I would hate that as a Jeffrey owner. I love Alshon Jeffrey. Just yep. an absolute target monster, bodying people up and getting in the end zone. Uh, you mentioned Willie Sneed, but I've also got him in two weeks. He gets the Steelers at home. Um, kind of a hit or miss play, but – could pay off big. Uh, Steelers obviously have that horrible pass defense. And oh, what about Jordy Nelson, by the way? I, I thought about it, and the reason I'm staying away is because I don't think Derek Carr is going to be their quarterback. Okay, I see you. And plus, I mean, if Jordy's a one, it's almost worse. He's here's, probably better off being a two at this here's point. Here's the problem, yeah. So now all the attention goes to Jordy and Jared Cook. Yeah. But now you also don't have Marshawn. So you don't have much of a run game. I, I just I, I don't know. I, I just feel like he's gonna get too much attention. He's not he doesn't have the ability. I guess if you're it. in the deepest league ever, Martavis Bryant, because one play I'd ra- I one think I'd rather have than, Martavis than Jordy. Yeah, because yeah. at least now the snap rate's going up for for Martavis. In theory, of course, but yep. we never know with Gruden. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, tight end baby. Good tight end recommendation. We've been on a roll with tight end. Here it is, Chris Herndon. Of yes. the Jets, less than 1% on. All in. Should have, 6%. Should have had two touchdowns this past weekend against the Vikings. Got one taken off the board. And if you if you don't want Herndon or you don't believe in it, Ricky Seals-Jones, 22%. So who do the Jets have this week? They, I know this. They have the Bears. Okay. Yes. So the Jets in two weeks. First of all, Herndon's caught a touchdown in back-to-back games. Yes. Number one. Number two. In two weeks, they get the Fins. The okay. Jets get the Fins. Dolphins just gave up two tight ends to a tight end on the Lions. Oh, my God. That a tight guy, end that nobody's even heard of. That guy is so infuriating. You know, that hurts your Luke Wilson shares. It does. <laughs> you don't have any shares. I know you no, don't. No, I don't. don't. But I remember, I remember one time you talked about yeah, it. Yeah, like, I thought it would be good. Like, shot in the dark, Luke Wilson, guy nobody's talking about for good reason. Because this <laughs> dude, Michael Roberts, whoever, comes in and – how does Kenny Galladay not get one? And he had one. They called it back, though, because Ragnow, man, that guy has some serious bad luck, that mm. left guard. Oh. I don't know. I don't even putting Roberts on here because it's one game. We don't. That's not enough. But I love the tight end from the Jets. I, I yeah, think Herndon, for the next yeah. two weeks, I think it'll be a good, good pickup. Right. And, I mean, let's see. Right now on by, you've got Hooper on by. You've got – Oh, God. That's it. Because Jeff Swain of the Cowboys, who cares about the tight end in Tennessee and the Chargers of Hunter Henry are useless at tight end. Um, so I guess what is week nine off the top of my head? The Jaguars. Nobody cares about the Jags. Who else is week nine? I think the Vikings might be week nine. So Bears. Rudolph. 
yeah, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. That's a good that's a good look though for Herndon two weeks in a row. And then the defense, it's very straightforward. Colts, they're go they're owned for sure, and their ownership is up because they got the Bills. But maybe someone's not paying attention that they're playing the Raiders. We'll drop them. Maybe pick up uh like an Edo Smith or a Mike Davis for that defense. Colts 48% on, so you're probably not getting them, but they're the number one. Number two is the Jets because they somehow keep scoring points as a defense. I don't know how it's possible, but they keep scoring points and against Trubisky. He's going to put the ball out there for him. So Jets 33% and then Chiefs 6%. Keenum's going to make some mistakes. He didn't even play that well against the Cardinals when they blew him out. So Chiefs 6% like owned. Uh, Those are the three defenses. In two me. weeks coming out of the bye, I mentioned earlier, but Cowboys again. I'm so up on the Cowboys defense, but they get the Titans off the bye on Monday Night Football. I, they just showed out on prime time against Jackson. That's a good. That's a good call. So now they're coming out of the bye and they get them on Monday Night. The Titans, who have a terrible offense, like I, I really like that play. They've only they've given up 24 points in a game. It's the most points they've given up. That's that's really good in the NFL. That you're not giving up more than 24 points in a game. Yeah. So Cowboys are just going to keep you in it. They're not going to lose you a fantasy football game, which is kind of what I like about their defense. Definitely, you've been on. I I have to give you credit. You've been on the Cowboys for it seems like forever. I don't know why. I don't. You just I saw usually it. hate the Cowboys. But I, I just their defense just plays well. Yeah. Which they don't have a ton of great players. They've got they, so they've got Demarcus Lawrence. They've got Sean Lee. Leighton Van Der Esch has been good. Byron Jones. Yeah, but it's not like they have a Patrick Peterson or yeah. an Aaron Donald or someone who's like a who's a a, a name who has a, a name value or whatever. So it's it's pretty good. That's you've been on the you've been on the Cowboys forever. Um, anything else you want to add there? Well, nope, that's it. Okay, uh, got to get to our number two takeaway. Of week seven. I think I said week eight earlier. No, this is week eight. Last week was week yeah. seven. Uh, your number two takeaway. Uh, I'm still in on the Bears. Um, mentioned them earlier. I thought they were the best team in that division. I, I, don't, I think the Vikings have probably left back up there, but I, I do still love the Bears. Pats needed two special teams touchdowns. I'm not saying they wouldn't score the touchdowns on, the, on these drives, but they needed two special team touchdowns to win, and they were a yard away from tying. The Bears were a yard away from tying on yeah. a Hail Mary. So, like, man, the, I know it was at home, but the Bears take the Patriots down to the wire, and the Patriots scored two special teams touchdowns. Yep. And they're a contender. And they're sitting at 3-3, three and three, and they should probably be – They should have – that should be – the so they should have lost to the Patriots, but they should have beaten the Packers, yes. so that's 4-2, and two, and had a chance who would have it. They should have beat the goddamn Dolphins, man. Oh, I'm never getting over that. I'm never getting over Jordan Howard not playing yeah. well in that game. So you're looking at you're looking at a team that should probably be five and one, and they're yeah. still young. They're still learning how to win. So I, I'm not going to take it away from them, but they've played kind of a gauntlet of a schedule early, and you know they're I'm, I'm just in on them. There's they I don't I still have a ton of faith in their defense. I know they've had kind of a rough one. Back they're to definitely back fantasy weeks. relevant. They're, they're fantasy, fantasy relevant, relevant for sure. sure. Uh, nice. There we go. My number two is I always I have a, I have a takeaway pretty much every week about coaching matters, but I'm going a little bit higher level. I think organizations matter as well, and I've got two examples. One, I think we're going to see with this Amari Cooper deal, we're going to see how good of an organization Dallas is because a good organization will take a player like that who has produced everywhere he's been and make him what he once was. Like I heard I heard a joke somewhere like no one's ever got worse after leaving the Raiders, right? So if Amari Cooper has a good season the rest of the way, that's an indictment on the Raiders organization. I mean, apart from John Gruden, because right now John Gruden is the organization, apparently doing whatever he wants. And my second example is this. Uh, the Cleveland Browns could not get Josh Gordon on the field for years. It stuck with them. Couldn't get him like, oh, he had this hamstring at a photo shoot, all this nonsense. He's been with the Patriots for a month. Hasn't had a hiccup. Not a single thing out of Patriots camp that says Josh Gordon has been a headache. Been to every meeting, been to every practice, been to every weight, like every workout, every rehab session. And that's because that organization is just flat out better. You know what? If it takes somebody following Josh Gordon around, living with them, the Patriots are going to do that because they know it's in their best interest to win. They know that's what that guy needs to succeed. So Cleveland is still a mess despite having their quarterback, which I like. But number two takeaway – organizations people don't understand how much 
a good organization can impact a football team. That's the only reason that Josh Gordon's effect is because the Patriots will not allow him to fail because they'll do whatever's necessary to keep him on the field. I 100% agree with you. Browns are a joke. I, I want to talk about, real quick, Hard Knocks. When you watched Hard Knocks and you saw how – Todd Haley talked about the players. Todd Haley, who'd been with some really good football teams and some good organizations. I'll just take Pittsburgh, yeah. for example. Yeah, in Pittsburgh's Kansas City. He was in Kansas City Kansas when City. they were when yeah. they were okay. Yeah. So, and then you you talk, you listen to the way he talked about players and the way they talk and the way he talked about how practices should be run. And then you listen to Hugh Jackson. And Hugh Jackson, the only thing Hugh Jackson kept saying was like. Well, I don't want to get guys hurt. Well, I don't want to get guys hurt. Well, I don't want to get guys People were sitting out practices that shouldn't have been sitting out practices. And Todd right. Haley's trying to get them on the field. Yeah. Hugh Jackson's, well, I don't want to get Because Todd Haley's hurt. like, listen, douchebag, the only way these guys are going to get better is if they practice exactly. and get reps. Exactly. So, I mean, you're 100% right. I mean, Oregon The Browns are really a joke. Nice. And how about Hugh Jackson? You know, offense is my specialty. I'm going to have to get more involved in that. Really? Because the last two seasons, you won one game. On what planet do you need to get more involved with any football team? Man, he needs to be fired before anyone. Like, he should have been fired way before Mike McCoy was. And Mike McCoy didn't even run the team. Oh, my goodness. Organizations matter so much more than people even even know. Uh, But, you know, let's get to our our predictions, Will. Our predictions. Uh, Man, for not having rants the last two weeks, we've been fired up today. We have been. I don't it, know what it is. You missing Thursday really did it. I guess that just bottled just be, up for a while. It, it, yeah, it, it happens when you don't have an outlet to talk. <laughs> uh, uh, your predictions, your positive predictions. So my predictions are both from the same game. Okay. Okay. And it's Saints-Vikings because I'm really excited about that game. But I'm going to say the Saints defense will show up for the first time this season. Not not for the first time, but like really show up in a big way. Yeah. Um, and if Eli Apple plays, he's going to be a big part of it. Um, I think he's going to be fired up coming to a new, a new good play. team. Yeah. yeah. How and about that organization? If he plays well for the Saints, another example yeah. of just what a good organization does. So that's my positive. The Saints D will have a good day against the Vikings offense. Uh-huh. And then, so my negative, based on that, Cousins is going to struggle at home in front of the home fans oh, against no. a good team, and it's going to be hard on him because yeah. he's kind of had that. And that's not code for anything. No. <laughs> it's not going for anything, but I, I don't know. I just kind of see it coming. Like they get Eli Apple. So now you're, you're going Thielen and Marshawn Lattimore and Diggs and Eli Apple, whichever way it goes. And Thielen's still going to have a big game because he's shown it doesn't matter who's covering him. But, but man, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Then you might have to rely on the run a little bit more. And I don't really have a lot of faith. They can run the ball consistently. Right. Um. So I just, I think this, the Saints defense and and I think Drew Brees is just going to steady the ship against a good team on the road and I think Cousins might have the tendency to fold. Okay. I, oh, really quickly because Drew Brees has been so been so good and played really well against the Ravens. Uh, top three MVP guys, the three MVP leaders for you, who are they? In no particular order. Uh, Drew Brees. Yep. Is definitely one of them. Um, Todd Gurley. Okay. Is another. And Patton Holmes. Okay. My three are almost identical. Mahomes, Breeze, and Rivers. Rivers is definitely up there. Five and two. But only. here's the here's the pro, here's my problem and with he's, Rivers. But he's he's been he's still been good. Like sixteen touchdowns, three picks. No, I think. I I love what he's doing. Yeah. He's having a great year, and the Chargers are having a great year. If you statistically look at what he's doing, he's not that different from what he's been, what, what he does every year. Yes, but this translates into wins, and we all know how much yeah. that matters. So like, I want to give Rivers some love. I know he's been playing so I just well. Think the, clip that Gurley's playing at the touchdown clip like I, I don't know yeah, how many he's, touchdowns does he have he's got more he has more points than the bills do that's unbelievable <laughs> yeah i don't know that's off the top of my head i believe I mean, you can i believe you can he does add to that list like you put rivers in there you can put Goff in there for sure you can put melvin gordon in there you can put brady in there you can uh, put, brady's always brady's in there. always in there but, but I mean, like, there's a there's a ton of players yeah. you can you can put in that. List. It's gonna make it exciting as we get down the stretch. Yes. it's gonna come from a playoff team. Has to, of course. Um, okay, let's see my prediction. I'll go my negative one first, and only because there was so much attention on last night's game. The Giants are gonna bench Eli after they lose to the Redskins because the Redskins Who are they have bench him for. Well, at least find out what Kyle Letta is, right? And at least find out what he is. Because if Kyle Laletta is Case Keenum, he's a better option than Manning at this point. 
because Shermer did this with Keenum last year. Now, I, you could say that the Vikings had a better offensive line, but you can't really say they had better personnel. I mean, oh my God, Beckham and Barkley look un, like unstoppable when Eli has a competent game. So I at least want them to find – if I'm a Giants fan, I want them to find out what Loretta is because if I don't have to spend a first-round pick on these quarterbacks that you hate – and I, I can get by with Aletta, then we'll get by with him. So they're going to bet. My prediction is they will bench him after losing to the Redskins because the Redskins front seven is going to annihilate the Giants. Yeah. Beckham and Barkley can still get off, but they're going to they're going to physically dominate the Giants what, offensive line. Here's, here's, the, here's my question about the Giants real quick. As I was watching that game and I watched Eli get pressured and pressured and pressured, why aren't they putting in more – I don't even want to say it this way because I get so upset when they say it on TV. But RPOs, RPO. <laughs> like put in a put Eli in the gun and let him run an RPO, RPO so you can get the either hand it to Barkley or yeah. get the ball out of his hand quickly. So I think, and you know, I would say, well, I mean, this team is dumb. But you know, who am I to say a coach is dumb or a staff is dumb? But I imagine they've tried that, and Eli can't get it done. I mean, because Eli, what it is? Eli, well, dude, he's. Just, he played well last night. This is the best game he's played all year yeah. by far. But he's still – he's just still missing dudes, he's man. He's missing guys, and, but – no, and there's no excuse. He's still going to make those throws. He had, he, he had Odell opening the answer. He was getting – but he's also getting mad at guys because he doesn't think they're breaking the right way. If right. You notice, like he's getting frustrated. Yeah. And I'll tend to, I'll tend to go with Eli on that. Right. He's a two-time Super Bowl winner. Like he understands what guys are supposed to be running. And he's play, and he's, he's just played longer than those he's, guys. Exactly. So, so like – but at the same time, he is missing guys. But he's just gun. He's so gun shy. He's trying. He's, yeah. He feels like he has. Even when he has time, he has to get the ball out of his hands so right. quick. Yes. Um. I would love them to at least try it because I didn't even. I haven't seen it. Like, but I mean, that's you, just how you. That's you get the ball out of your hand quickly, or you hand it to your best player. Yeah. I mean, it just seems to make sense to me. And he needs to be in the gun more. Absolutely. I, I, get, I get like you want to hand the ball to Saquon, especially off, like it's it's forward. so and with a weapon like Saquon, you want to do play action. But being under center, like. The risk you run now is Eli has his back to the formation. If he pulls up and there's a guy in his face, he's going to just fall yeah. down. And at his age and like his, I guess his the progression of his career, that's his best decision. But shit, if you know that's happening, you're right. Exclusively shotgun. So there's this barrier between the offensive line and just so you can get time for him to deliver the yeah. ball. And it's I mean, help them. They need to have. I mean, Red Ellison needs to play more, and Ingram needs. The, here's what the offensive set should be. It should be. In my opinion, and what do I know, but it should be two tight ends, one running back. Because Ingram's not really a tight end, so it should be yep. Beckham, Shepard, Ingram at wide receivers. Those should just be the wide receivers. Rhett Ellison, and then Saquon Barkley. Because Rhett should just stay in the block. He always needs to be blocking 100%. all the time. Because those guys will win one-on-one matchups if you give Eli enough time to throw. Um, and you can chip. And you can chip Barzay Saquon can chip on the opposite, other side. Yeah, so... That's personally what I would do because Ingram is pretty good. He's just not – if he has to block, first of all, he's not good at blocking. No. And that's not what he's best at anyway. That's not what they draft him in the first round for. So I agree with you. Negative prediction and a circle back around Sorry. here. No, no, no. no. I'm, I'm always good with the rants and the, and the tangents. Uh, Giants bench Eli after losing to Washington. And number one, you talked about it. Saints keep marching in. They're going to get another one in a row. They're yeah. going to get revenge on the Vikings for that playoff game last year. And I don't know, don't look now, but I think the Saints could emerge as a Super Bowl as a Super Bowl favorite out of the NFC. I yeah. mean, not just a favorite, the favorite, because the Rams cannot keep this up, right? They just it just has to stop at some point because God, Gurley, can he keep scoring touchdowns like this? I don't know that answer. I mean, the right bet. I guess the right bet is yes, but then we're talking about a guy who's potentially going to break Ladainian Tomlinson's record, which does not get broken, right? Yeah. Thirty-two touchdowns, thirty-three touchdowns. That doesn't get, that doesn't happen. But, anyways, that's my positive prediction. Uh, let's wrap this thing up. Let's get to our number one takeaways of week seven. But first, we'll review your top five. Uh, number five for me, the Raiders really got a first rounder for Amari Cooper, and <laughs> I feel stupid. Number four. Eagles and Panthers was pretty much exactly what I thought it was going to be a great football game with two really good quarterbacks. Number three, Lions finally have a run game. Number two, uh, I'm still up on the Bears. Um, the Patriots need some special teams touchdowns to get, a jo- get it done in Chicago. And number one, and you're going to disagree with me because this was opposite of your Point rant, of contention, yes. The Jaguars can still salvage their season. And 
I'm not saying they will because they're headed in the wrong direction for sure. They've got issues in the locker room. They've got guys fighting each other. Blake Bortles is terrible. There, there's more reasons why they're not going to than why they will. But they here's the reasons that they can. They've still got the number one ranked pass defense in the league. Nobody can throw the ball on them still. Like you saw Deshaun Watson, everybody's like, yeah, he had a great game against No, Jackson. he did. He threw for 150 yards. He had a 5.1 YPA. That's yeah. not that's not getting it done no. against a team with a competent offense. No. So and and they went Houston won. They won 20 to seven, but. It's not like he did anything spectacular. Yeah, when, the, when Blake Bortles gift wraps you yeah. 10 points, I mean, exactly. you're going to win that game. So the Jags are sitting here at 3-4. and four. In the next three weeks, they have Philadelphia, they have a bye week, and then they have Indianapolis. And f- so they've got a great pass defense. Okay, so Philly and Indy, they throw the ball well. Yep. They don't run the ball well. Not Yeah, not over a, a big uh, body of work, so no. I'll take Jacksonville's pass D against Philly and against Indy. I think... St- Jacksonville's defense against those strengths in the offense, I think Jacksonville's defense trumps it if they play the way they're supposed to play. Now, all this only matters if they do what they need to do and go out and acquire a quarterback. I like That's that. That's how they salvage their season. They acquire a quarterback, and they continue to play defensively like they know they can play and like they have played passing on the pass D. They continue to do that, and they go out and acquire a quarterback. They're still a contender. Who? So you're three guys they can go get. Uh, number one for me, and we just talked about him, but Eli Manning is is number one for me because it doesn't mortgage their future. Right. Um, Which is good because a lot of people were always like, well, if the Raiders are selling Derek Carr, but Derek Carr costs $25 yeah, million. Exactly. You've already got Bortles for 19 So number two, if you've got guys that evaluated the talent and they feel really good about Carr moving forward as your future quarterback, yeah. then Carr's, Carr's a better option than Eli. He's a better quarterback than but Eli But Eli gives is, you right? the flexibility to move on. Exactly. So say – you go out and get him, but Eli doesn't get the job done. Okay, no big deal. Not to mention the Tom Coughlin connection if he's the exactly. operations guy at the Jaguars. So the third guy for me, and I don't know why nobody's not, nobody's talking about this more, but we just saw Cleveland's open for business. Why not Tyrod Taylor? He's not going to turn the ball over, right? Right. He's got the mobile. He's a, he's a mobile quarterback. Similar well, he doesn't Bortles, fumble for being a mobile guy. He doesn't, he doesn't fumble. He doesn't it's fumble. weird. So – you got to remember too, Cleveland's willing to trade a quarterback, I would think, because they still have Drew Stanton on their roster, who's inactive every game. Yep. But he's on their active roster, so why not try to acquire? You could probably get Tyrod for like a sixth round pick. Right. Something. Like, something. So like, those would be the three guys that I I would probably target. I I don't know who else you'd go out there and get. Maybe like an RG three, I guess. But. I don't know. I think Teddy Bridgewater's thoughts? been a while since he's seen live bullets, so I don't know about Bridgewater. What I about do. what about Fitz? I think Fitz would be a good option. Um, I don't know. I like Fitz's what about, veteran presence. What about, what about Chad, Chad Kelly? Did you hear about this? Yeah, no. <laughs> that guy should be cut and never be allowed to play in the NFL. Was he on something for breaking and trespassing? I like, don't know. He's gotten in trouble so many times. How are you a court? I just don't understand how you can be a quarterback, like a team leader, and you just continue to get in trouble and do things the wrong way. Everywhere he's been. Yeah. Ole Miss. Where, Broncos. He was pre-draft. Some, he was some at Juco. somewhere before Ole Miss. He was at a – gosh, what school? He was at another school before – he was at Tennessee. Was he really? I think it was Tennessee. He was at <clears throat> somewhere else. He got kicked out of his first school. He's, he's terrible. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I love that uh, that number one take right there. My number five, Monday Night Football crew for ESPN, is, it blows is my exact wording. Number four, I believe in the Saints. Number three, I think the Jags are done. You made a very good case as to how they could salvage the season. I don't know if, one, they have the balls to go do that to make those moves. And I also don't know if they can actually execute if they made the move. So, But you laid out a good path for them, so I appreciate that. Number two, organizations – have a huge impact on whether or not players are good in the success of a franchise. And number one, Josh Rosen will be fine. Don't worry about anything you see this year from Rosen. This is a lost season, just like we saw with golf his first year. When you play under a guy who doesn't call plays for the modern NFL, you're not going to look good. Um, and I also don't agree with benching him either, like quote unquote, saving his body. No, he needs to get these reps. I mean, game reps when there's no pressure that's fantastic that's for a, that's fantastic for a guy like that he needs to build rapport with these receivers. They need to be able to properly evaluate. 
their talent on the offensive line at, at wide receiver because if you have a backup in there, you don't truly know how good that player is. But if you have your quarterback for the future and they're not gelling with him, well, you know it's that's a them problem. they got to get out. So don't bench Rosen, but don't overreact to anything. Just look to see is he is he – is he getting better? Meaning, is he handling um, is he handling pre-snap better? Or is he not having delay of game penalties anymore? Is he, you know, handling situational football the right way? Meaning, is he checking down on third and eighteen, or is he pushing the ball? Like little things like that, uh, you can tell if a guy's getting better without seeing the results in the win loss column. I'm 100 percent with you on Rosen. I'm, I'm just don't worry about it. I'm really fine. not worried about him at all. I I think Rosen could easily end up being the best quarterback out of that class. He could be. Um and there, there's no reason to think he couldn't be he couldn't do exactly what Jared Goff's doing. Goff had better has better players around him and I think moving forward even if the, if Arizona gets better, I don't think they're going to be the Rams, but I I don't know. Maybe maybe he can do what what Goff does. Well, they got to get an offensive coordinator in there first of all. Uh but no. Byron Leftwich. Byron I I'm excited to see this because if he can can really turn this thing around. More fantasy relevant players, the better. The more options we have at our disposal for seasonal and DFS, I'm always for it. Uh, but that's gonna wrap up our seasonal edition of this week's Suck My DFS podcast. Both of us will be back on Thursday. If we, that's what the plan is right now, we will both be here on Thursday. I'll be here. Will will be here, so I'll be here too because we do this at my house. <laughs> uh, so we'll be back on Thursday with our, our DFS. Uh, picks and opinions of the slate. We will see you then.